I grew up an elementary aged kid in the early 2000s, and I vividly remember the Disney Channel original movie, Smart House. It's on Disney Plus now if you want to watch it, it doesn't really hold up. But Ben Cooper, a 13 year old kid, wins a smart house in a contest after the death of his mother. Uh, and the house is supposed to take care of himself, his sister, and his father in like a housewife role. But the house eventually becomes evil, preventing anyone from leaving, and then burns itself down, killing the whole family. Okay, so I maybe embellished that last part a little bit, but I remember as a kid thinking that none of this smart home stuff was ever going to happen in the real world. There would never be meals on demand, self-cleaning floors, lights controlled by voice, a totally sick party mode, and sure, several of those things haven't and will never come. But many of them have come to fruition and in ways far superior to what had been dreamt up in Smart House. But look, a lot of modern smart home tech, to put it nicely, sucks. And there are even entire internet accounts dedicated to pointing out the smart home blunders. With dozens of apps to manage, fragmented voice assistant support, and lousy automation, most smart homes do suck. But they don't have to. I have built my home on three distinct principles. Number one, all smart devices must be controllable non-smartly, either via a remote or on-device button. Number two, all devices must integrate into a singular centralized app with a singular voice assistant for support. And number three, automation must never get in the way. So let me show you how I built my smart home that's not stupid. It all starts with centralized control, and for that reason, I have chosen HomeKit. Now, this is largely in part due to the fact that both my wife and I are primarily Apple users. And while I have my complaints about HomeKit, and I'll get to those in a minute, there are a few things that HomeKit does amazingly well that neither Google nor Amazon offer in their, well, offerings. For one, all HomeKit devices connect to a Home Hub. Now, this can be an Apple TV, a HomePod, rip, HomePod Mini, or Home Locked iPad. And all devices must be able to operate without an internet connection directly to the Home Hub on my local area network. This means when my internet goes down or when the company that I bought X accessory from goes out of business, it doesn't turn into a paperweight. Everything still works. And that's important when adding smart home gadgets because they're not necessarily cheap. Additionally, thanks to the Find My app, HomeKit has extraordinarily powerful person-aware geolocation automations. I can and do have automations that run not just based on if someone is home, but who is home or who isn't and how far away they are from home. I'll talk about that a little later. Last, I like HomeKit because of its security. Now, Apple certification for smart devices is much higher than Google and Amazon's. And while this certainly doesn't mean that HomeKit is perfectly safe, nothing is, and I have taken extra precautions like using VLANs. They're awesome, and so expect a video soon on that. HomeKit is generally a better network citizen than the other two. So let's start at the base of the tree and build upwards. It all starts, as I mentioned, with the Home Hub or Home Hubs. Interestingly, Apple lets you have multiple hubs for redundancy and increased speed. Any TV or HomePod will default to being a hub. And what's really great about having multiple hubs is that it gives you greater in-room control. For example, when I'm watching TV and somebody rings my doorbell, a video feed pops up with options to respond. Or since I'm in this room, I can say, hey, S turn on the lights. And the HomePod right here knows that I want to turn the lights on in this room without me having to state where I'm located in the home. Hey, turn off the lights. Previously, this was cost prohibitive, but now with HomePod Mini now available for $99, it's a little more reasonable to put speakers and by consequence hubs in rooms where you previously may not have. After you've installed your hubs, with which you can command Siri, it's time to actually install smart home devices. Now, HomeKit is neat in the sense that it has this huge community making unofficial plugins for unsupported devices by way of HomeBridge or Home Assistant. Now, I have a few of those and I will talk about them shortly. But as a general rule of thumb, you should buy devices natively supported by the platform whenever possible. 
Now, HomeKit initially had a really small list of supported devices. And by comparison to Alexa or Google, it's still small. But it has grown quite healthy in the last few years. For lights, I didn't want to go with smart bulbs. There's a few reasons behind this. Most of the lights in my home, they're pendants, and thus the light bulbs themselves are visible. And smart bulbs, well, they're seldom sexy, and this makes them an immediate non-starter in my home. But the other problem is they're expensive, and those darned switches. Since smart bulbs power themselves directly from the light socket, they only work when the light switch feeding them power is on. When guests visit and flip the switches willy-nilly on your wall, it can get frustrating and screw everything up. Additionally, look, maybe I'm just a caveman, but I like touching light switches when I enter the room. We need to get rid of this notion that everything smart has to be commanded by voice or smartphone app. And while there are wall-mounted remote-style solutions for wireless bulbs, I return to my previous point that A, they're expensive, and B, smart devices should never get in the way. I needed a traditional light switch that acted like a light switch. And that mostly left me, well, with really only one option, Caseta by Lutron. I don't know, Caseta, 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 Caseta. Vamos a la casa. This was the first smart home purchase I made about six months ago, and I have not regretted it for a second. They're bulletproof because, well, they're just, they're normal light switches. You can press the top button to turn the light on, the bottom button to turn the light off, and the arrows in the middle to dim up or down. This functionality requires zero smart home build out. It will work forever, always. It's, it's just a light switch. But it's not just a light switch because it has built-in smarts. If you have a Lutron hub, which is plugged into your network via ethernet, you can control all of these light switches via their app, which is fine if nothing to write home about, but also natively within the HomeKit Home app. Because this hub and its switches run off of a 431 megahertz radio frequency, you don't pollute your entire Wi-Fi network with light switches and light bulbs. The transmission distance on these things is insanely excellent. I have that little hub in the basement uh, right next to a brick wall and it communicates with all of my light switches in the entire house through multiple brick walls without any issue. Additionally, if you like the idea of three-way light switches, that is to say, multiple light switches that control the same light in a room, Lutron sells these inexpensive Pico remotes. They're powered by a coin cell battery, but they last up to 10 years on a charge. And they can be used handheld, mounted to their little pedestal attachment, or as I prefer, directly mounted to the wall like a regular light switch. You'd never know that this wasn't a real light switch plugged into a wall because they work flawlessly and they look really good, but they're not, and they work even without a network connection. Okay, so the lights were solved, but I recognized that I needed some blinds to close my many large windows around our home that require privacy. Rather than raise and lower blinds manually, because you just get lazy, I knew I needed to go smart. And I found out that Lutron themselves, well, they make shades, Serena Shades, a daughter company whose smart blinds communicate over the same Caseta Hub protocol. Now, after some discussions, they kindly offered to sponsor this video and I accepted, but I must disclose that they've provided no talking points, they have no directorial input, and they're seeing this video at the same time you are. And that's important because sponsors can't make me say that I like anything, and so I pretty much never do, but holy crap, I love these Serena shades. They're custom fit to your window which is fantastic because you just measure the window frame yourself, uh, or you can have an expert come do it, but it took me like 10 minutes to do the whole house. It's very easy. And then you can choose one of many fabric luminosities, textures, colors, and finishes. The blinds, well, they ship surprisingly quickly and they seriously take less than five minutes each to install. Uh, using a spirit level, you just install a mounting bracket onto your window casing, and then you drop the shade in. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I know that sounds overly simplified, but it really isn't. It is a piece of cake. They're powered over either an AC adapter or D-cell batteries. I opted for the latter, and it is a little weird loading up eight massive batteries per shade, but they're supposed to last several years between battery replacement, and when it comes time to finally do that, it'll just take a couple of minutes. I like the shades because they're rather quiet. They all roll down at the exact same time and speed, which is rarer than you would think for a smart shade. Most of them are like just slightly behind each other. And you can control them with a large wireless remote via your phone using their app or HomeKit, 
Siri, and with wall-mounted Pico remotes just like the Lutron light switches. For example, neither of these light switches for my lights or shades are quote unquote real, <laughs> but you'd never know that. And they look flawless on the wall. Look, Lutron stuff isn't cheap. There are less expensive options out there, but there's also more expensive options. And if you go to the Lutron subreddit or pretty much anywhere else, you'll just find people worshiping like everything they make. And I'm discovering that there is a reason for that. They are really, really good. And they are, because I can't explain it better, bulletproof. They just always work. If you're interested, I've left links in the video description below. Now look, I do have other native HomeKit accessories, like my garage door opener, which literally doesn't have another app. It was set up within and only within HomeKit and is not at all connected to the internet, which is awesome. Or the Sonos speakers. I have two, uh, one at each of my TVs, which are HomeKit and AirPlay compatible, making it super easy to play back multi-zone music in the house that's controllable by Siri. But there are also a flurry of devices that I want to use in my home, which are not HomeKit compatible. And now we get to my complaints with HomeKit. Apple has done very little since the release of HomeKit in 2016 to increase the catalog of smart connected things. For example, Samsung Smart Things <laughs> supports refrigerators, ovens, washing machines, robot vacuums, smoke detectors, valves, etc. None of which are supported in HomeKit and it can get really frustrating. Luckily, there's a great community of HomeKit enthusiasts that want to bring unsupported devices to the platform. And how it works is really simple. You first install the Homebridge software on a Raspberry Pi or old computer that's plugged into your network. Now, because of the quantity of high resolution cameras that I have around my home, I needed a computer with a little bit more beefiness. So I'm actually running Homebridge as a background instance on an old 2018 Mac mini. Now this app basically pretends to HomeKit to be a hardware bridge and mimics official support for devices that, well, aren't. Once you've got Homebridge installed, you access its control panel via its local IP address, and then you can start installing plugins for the devices that have them. Now, there are really, as far as I'm concerned, three levels of Homebridge support. Number one, plug and play. Number two, supported with caveats. And number three, jank city. For example, I love my Ubiquiti cameras and doorbell because they are fantastic quality, they're extremely robust, and they record locally instead of sending stuff to the cloud, which I appreciate. Unfortunately, there's no HomeKit support and I doubt that it will ever come. But that doesn't much matter as the Homebridge Unify Protect plugin does everything I could hope for and more with native support. After an easy GUI based setup process, all of my cameras show up inside of my home app in full resolution with support for two-way audio and even cooler yet, my doorbell, well, it has this little screen that sends messages to people and even that is supported in Homebridge as well. It appears as a switch that I can toggle on and off in the home app and it works amazingly. It's plug and play and basically makes this unsupported device, well, a native one, no different. The second level is supported with caveats, rather stretching HomeKit beyond what it's really intended to do. This is a Broadlink RM3 Mini. It's a cheapo smart enabled IR blaster that I'll leave linked down below if you're interested. But it can basically make any infrared device like a mini split air conditioning system, an AV amplifier, or in my case, a bidet smart enabled by sending IR commands. Now the Homebridge app for this plugin is certainly less user friendly, being largely command line based, but it's not too tricky to set up and there are a number of helpful YouTube tutorials if you get stuck. But once you program the IR commands that you want, you can turn them into home app actions. Now they're kind of weird because they each pop up as a button or as a switch. And so they're not quite as elegant as say a native AV remote built into HomeKit, but it's as good as it gets. And it does work. I can say, hey Siri, each Is it elegant? No, but it works. And then the last level, Jank City. What I mean by this is the process of supporting devices in HomeKit that HomeKit is really not well equipped to support, like my Ecovacs T8 AIVI robot vacuum. Look, I am a big fan of vacuums, and this one is my current favorite. 
Not only does it have a superb auto empty docking station that always keeps the vacuum small bin empty, but it also has extraordinarily good mapping and it leaves carpet lines better than any other vacuum on the market. And so it looks freshly vacuumed all the time. It has really intelligent go and no go zones and it has higher than average suction. I'll leave a link down below if you're interested, but one of the main reasons I love it, okay, not the main reason, but one of the side reasons I love it is that there is a HomeBridge plugin to support it. Now, HomeKit, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't actually support robot vacuums. And so HomeBridge has tricked HomeKit into believing that this robot vacuum is a fan. <laughs> so if I turn the fan on, the robot will do an automatic cleanup around the house and I can adjust the suction power of the vacuum by adjusting the fan speed inside of the home app. Weirder yet, you can specify that the vacuum clean a particular zone, like the kitchen floor after making a meal, which is really nice, and you can do it without having to enter the official Ecovacs app simply by toggling on and off switches inside the home app, but this is where it gets weird. If I turn off the auto cleaning switch, which is the default, it just pauses the task. So I have to turn on the end task switch to get it to go back to the dock. Turning on a switch, to go back to the dock. And then once it's arrived, it can't start a new route until I turn that return to dock switch off. So look, it's a little janky. I still need to open the official Ecovacs app eventually and sometimes for finer control, but it does work most of the time. And it is pretty awesome to be able to tell Siri to just vacuum the kitchen after a meal and have it happen. Okay, so you may not have your devices installed, but they're nothing without a place to control them. The official Apple Home app is, ugh, I love it and I hate it. You see, it's really good at being reliable, quick, and it integrates well with Control Center, which I appreciate, and there is a Mac variant, but it's also mega ugly without some user input. I've created a bunch of custom wallpapers for each room in my house to make them quickly and easily identifiable which has helped a lot with visual clutter because by default, all rooms use the same wallpaper. Then I've hidden a lot of the cruft that I don't need to see. For example, I have a multi-sensor device in just about every room, which detects motion, presence, humidity, ambient light, and temperature. They're cool and all, but I really don't need to know the humidity from room to room inside of an app. And it's really only an automation that I actually make use of this stuff. So while it's a little bit of a bummer to hide all of that cool info you just spent money on to get, it is worth hiding the stuff that you don't actually use with frequency because it will only clutter up the app's UI and make for a worse experience. The great thing about home kit is that it has a number of awesome app store apps that attempt to resolve the home apps limited user experience. Home Plus is a $15 app that allows you to make much more powerful automations than the default home app using Boolean logic and a number of other if and and clauses. For example, one of the automations I have is to automatically turn off the alarm system when my wife or I gets home and to turn on the downstairs lights but only if it's 30 minutes before sunset. Otherwise, they remain off. You see, you can get super complex with the automations and scenes that you set up. And the great part is that they still propagate inside the official home app, so you can run them without having to enter that paid Home Plus app every time. Last, it just came out, and I am no expert at it yet, but I am really loving the new SceneFlow app. Rather than have a dedicated page for every room like the Home app, which can get really cluttered when you have one device in a room, which there are a few rooms where I have that, the SceneFlow just puts everything in a scrollable list, which makes it very easy to select in a hurry. The other thing I appreciate is that it has a dedicated home security tab, which allows me quick insight to window and door sensors that I have disabled in the official home app because again, clutter. It also allows me the option to quickly arm and disarm my security system and view my camera feeds. Organizing both by room and device type is amazing, and the app is free. I, I literally haven't paid for it yet. I don't even know what the features unlocked are. Uh, a couple, you get to move stuff around. And point in case, if, if you want it, it's free. If you wanna pay, it's locked behind a pretty cheap yearly subscription. And that really brings me to my last point. Don't lose sleep over 100% compatibility. For example, my Abode alarm system, it's natively integrated into HomeKit, and I love it because while the stock app is fine, being able to view the state of my motion sensors, my door and window switches, my camera feeds, and being able to arm and disarm everything from the main Home app, it's amazing. 
But there's a really cool third-party gadget that uh, is supported by Abode called Dome. I have a bunch of these water leak sensors placed around my house ready to detect any misplaced moisture. And when they do in fact detect a leak, the dome's motor slowly closes the main water line coming into my house, stopping any potential leaks dead in their tracks until I can return home and consult with a plumber. Stuff like this has the potential to save thousands of dollars down the line in case of an emergency, but the dome sensor, it's, it's not HomeKit compatible and it's only exposed as a device inside of my Abode app. But it's like, big deal, who cares? It's not like I'm going to be using it with frequency and it can save me money in the long run. Conversely, my induction range, it has a smart app and it's actually more useful than I expected it to be because it has support for Heston Q cookware and sous vide precise temperature control. There's no HomeKit range out there. And even though technically this range supports if this then that and Samsung smart things, it's not worth using any of those over the stock app, which works fine. No smart home is going to be perfect, but I feel like I've gotten pretty close, even if it's not the flashiest of smart homes. It always works, it's controlled smartly, and it can also be controlled not smartly. Everything is unified in a centralized app and it never becomes a nuisance. I love it, just like I'd love it if you gave this video a like. If you hated this video, well, send it to someone you hate. They're gonna despise it too. Thank you so much for watching this video. Get subscribed if you wanna see more stuff like this in the future. But most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.